hi everybody, thank you for joining. I hope everyone ate, they're not hungry, they're ready to hear about some cool, awesome automating stuff. Um, my name is Lauren Santiago. I'm a system administrator for uh, the identity and access management team at Red Hat. Um, I work in IT there. Today, I'm gonna talk to you guys about how I got started with Ansible. Ansible tower infrastructure set up at Red Hat IT. Um, the on-call process automation that we set up with Ansible and Ansible Tower. We're going to talk a little bit about Nagios event handlers and Ansible Tower and at the end have some time for Q&A. Um, so how I got started with Ansible, I started as an intern at Red Hat and when they converted me to a full-time employee, I, I didn't have very much Linux experience so I wanted to prove myself and I was volunteering to do everything that would come up. And one of those opportunities was Release Engineer, and they already were using Ansible for their releases. Um, so that's how I first started using it. And then over time, I started training as uh, Release Lead, which allowed me to start editing playbooks, troubleshooting issues, helping people create their own. I worked with upgrading Ansible, upgrading the code. Um, so I just started getting more hands-on with it, and that's how I got really into Ansible. Um, I've been using it about three years now, and then my favorite thing to do with Ansible is help train somebody who's never used it and automate their first task or something that they've always done manually and show them how to get it automated, schedule it, and bring them into using Ansible as well. Um, so for the Ansible Tower infrastructure set up at Red Hat, we, we have more than two data centers there, but um, with Ansible Tower, we have a staging environment, which is testing, but we have our main one in Phoenix 2, and then we have our DR in RDU 2. Uh, both of them are behind an F5 there. Um, there's three tower nodes, and in our primary data center for Ansible Tower, I have a Postgres database that's clustered, so there's an active and a passive which we could use a playbook to cut over and switch it anytime we want if we need to, which also helps when the DBAs are upgrading and doing different things so we can prevent outage. Um, because we use Ansible Tower for something like self-healing with the on-call process, uh, we created a DR environment because we didn't want to ever have any downtime. Um, so that one has a secondary Postgres node that is passive until we cut over to DR, which we use a playbook to make that one active. The cut over to DR right now with a lot of the applications there is manual. Not all of them, but with Ansible Tower it is. I mean, we use playbooks, but it's, someone has to run each playbook to get it set up that way. But it's just so we don't have any outages, so it's, o it's always running and available for us. Um, so some of the steps that were automated with the on-call process, well, this is all of them. So a service alerts on a host that's broken. Nagios is our monitoring system. It's monitoring it. So when a host is broken or the service is alerting, it will then call the Ansible Tower API. And then so initially what that playbook will do, well, it'll call a job, set, run a playbook. Initially it'll set five minutes of downtime. It does this to let Nagios um, actually run the playbook or make the call to the tower to run the playbook and give it time to fix the host. Um, then once the playbook finishes and the alert clears, we have a blog that's created if it's a production system in our um, document, documentation space in Jive. Um, this is so the service owner as well as the on-call team knows that a playbook was ran against a host and that it was broken. Um, it's also announced an IRC to the on-call team and the service owner uh, about what host alerted and what job was ran and what fixed it. And then an email is sent and an IRC message is sent if it fails, which then uh, Nagios then pages the on-call person as well. Um, so we have it set up like that, just where it used to be the on-call person would have to um, acknowledge the alert themselves, 
then go open the documentation space, find the playbook that the service owner provides, and then manually follow the steps to fix the host. Then they'd manually have to create the blog. And so it, this just makes it where none of them have to do it. Um, so I just want to include some pictures so you guys could see. This was um, some jobs where you could see where, I mean, it's running at 3 or 4 in the morning where there is someone on call 24-7, but they didn't actually have to get paged or get online to fix it or anything like that. It all was fixed. Um, so the on-call team and the service owners can look at the jobs that were ran. They also have the Mojo blogs. And then they're also implementing code now where it tracks with the CMDB, where if a host keeps alerting, or it alerts multiple times within a certain time period, it'll open a ticket in service now, which then it'll go into service owner's queue because they don't want hosts to keep, you don't want a production host to keep restarting services every day. Something obviously more is wrong, and they want it to be looked into, fixed, all that. So that's how everyone's more aware of what's going on. Um, here's an example of the blog posts. Uh, right now, this is just like one of the first basic ones where you can see it announces that a playbook was ran by Tower on the host, the date, the time. It gives a link to the Tower job status. Um, they're adding right now in the inventory files variables to the service owner so they can also be tagged. So it's not where they have to go look at it. They'll get an email or notification that their host was broken. Uh, so some configuration and infrastructure management about Red Hat. Just to touch base of some context of what I'm talking about. So Puppet is our main configuration tool that we use there. Nagios is our monitoring tool. How many of you guys in here use Nagios as your monitoring tool? Okay. Um, Ansible Engine they use for releases, ad hoc repair commands. Um, they use it for building hosts on VMs. Ansible Tower is used for the self-filling, uh, DB configuration. And then they're also moving release process. And then a lot of teams in IT have scheduled jobs in Tower of daily tasks that they want completed. Um, before this, integration between Nagios and Ansible Tower did not exist. Uh, so we developed our own and open sourced it. So I can, I'll talk about that more later. Um, for those of you who don't use Nagios or don't know, Nagios is an open source uh, monitoring tool for computer systems. It was built for Linux. It can be used on other operating systems. Um, does periodic checks of services, applications, networking. Uh, it can be agentless, and it uses agent. It uses an RPE agent. Um, it's just a little bit of background, just so you guys can kind of understand. I'm sure everyone has diff at least a monitoring service. It may be different, but they're all pretty similar, just with different benefits. Um, this is also an example from Nagios, so, so you can see what a host monitored by Nagios looks like. The local host over there would be the host. Um, there's default checks that come that um, Nagios will monitor, and then service owners can configure uh, custom checks for certain services, either to make sure it's running, if they want to have a script ran and make sure it returns a certain result, they can do that. Um, and then they can determine what gives back an OK status and what gives a critical status, which would determine what's paged or what caused the Ansible Tower API to run the playbook. Uh, standard monitoring workflow for Nagios. So right now, if, if a service is OK, it will check every five minutes against that. If it comes back critical, it would check again, and, but a minute later. Then it checks again a minute later, and it checks again. Once it comes back critical the fourth time, it would uh, alert the on-call person. Then what they would have to do is what I was saying before. They would have to acknowledge the alert to silence it. And then that person would have to go look for documentation, which is in a separate place in the documentation space. And then they'd have to perform the necessary actions that's provided by the service owners. Um, 
And then once it fixes it, it goes back to OK, and now you just continues to check five minutes. Um, so with the workflow with Ansible Tower in Nagios, it's a little different. Um, so we it still does the five minute check every time. When it comes back critical, it triggers the event handler, but it doesn't run the script to call the Ansible Tower API because we don't want to, we were trying to prevent false alarms, which before it would check two or three times before it would page the person on call. Um, we don't want it to actually page the person on call, so on the third check is when the API handler makes the call to Ansible Tower. That triggers the job, sets the downtime, and again, the downtime is set, so Nagios doesn't keep triggering the event handler or page the person on call, and it gives Ansible time to run the playbook, hopefully fix the host, clear it, and if it doesn't, then that's when the on-call person's still paged. Um, it'll take the node out of rotation, take the corrective um, actions, It'll put the node back into the rotation, but one of the things that they were forcing the service owners was to create a check in their playbook that has to return a certain value before uh, Ansible will even put that host back into the load balancing, because we don't want to put the broken host back. We'd rather get the on-call person to look or get the service owner on to look at it if it's normal hours and see if we can get it fixed. Um, then it creates the blog post about the event, sends a notification to IT on-call person, and then Nagios is back to green and happy and checking every five minutes. Um, so right now, the developers deploy services. They define their Nagios checks using Puppet. Um, it's put in Puppet modules developed by IT. It's very little code. Like I was saying, some's already predefined and came, it comes with Nagios. Um, they can get as detailed as they want. The service owners know their systems and what their applications need to do the most, so that's why it heavily depends on them at least working with us or them coding what they want it to do. Um, Ansible Tower generates a generic host inventory from the list of hosts monitored by Nagios. This is also like a dynamic inventory that's created from them. Um, this is helpful because what the on-call team ended up doing is things like SSH or NRP, something that's monitored already by Nagios, they can create a check to restart the service, just a generic template that if that alert, um, th so this way every single host that's monitored by Nagios, if one of those alert, Tower will know, oh, run this playbook to fix that service. Um, so, and then IT built a set of standard system repair playbooks, a lot of um, services just need a restart. That um, is a really simple playbook. We also created one that had like extra vars where if it's not something you could put, if they have a, um, a host that has multiple services that sometimes A needs to be restarted, sometimes B needs to be restarted, so they created a, a generic playbook where, or a generic job template where it could have extra vars provided by Nagios and by the inventory from the service owner. Uh, developers are welcome to build their own repair playbooks, host inventories, however they want to do it. They could depend on Nagios. Um, there's plenty of documentation. That is one of the things I will say is key too, is if this is something that you do implement, document everything so service owners can also jump in and do their own and don't have to depend heavily on you. But, you know, like myself and others make themselves available to help with whatever they need. Um, so to break down the Nagios event handler definition, so usually it's a, this is kind of like in Puppet, um, and that's how they uh, code that in there. So it's a command name where, for example, we're using the tower handler one that gets called, and then it's a command line, which is usually a script, which is the code, where it will, Nagios will call the Ansible Tower API, and then there's the state of how many attempts, because by default with Ansible Tower, we have it set to the, four, to the third, but service owners can change it, like, hey, we don't want a, any action taken unless our host alerts five times, unless, or some, sometimes they want it, uh, action taken immediately. First time it alerts, we don't care, we want it fixed. Um, there's the downtime, where they set the downtime on the service, the host name, which is the host that's alerting. The inventory, um, they can hard code it in Puppet, 
if it's for sure always going to be that, they can use the dynamic inventory, which comes from Nagios. And then there's a limit, which limits it to that host, because sometimes, you know, they have 10 hosts in an inventory. They don't want to restart, take out all of them. So they limit it to, they can pick limits where, you know, if host A alerts, but they want to fix A, C, and E, they can change it to where all of those come out at once, one at a time. There's different limits they can set. Um, this is an example with the handler. So the event handler is at the end, and that's just where it would call the restart service. They're, it's, they're telling it to use the generic inventory and the service name, which um, is, if, since it's not included in the playbook that's provided in the inventory, um, it's just like an extra bar. So um, Nagios is, will tell Ansible Tower, and Ansible Tower will play, run the playbook with Ansible, and it'll know to restart HTTPD for the host that's alerting, and um, it's based off the generic inventory. So it's going to be pulled automatically from what was alerting. Um, so the code that was created for the handler to call Ansible Tower, it, this is just like a simplified version so you guys could see, because I wanted it to be more of like tech deep, tech deep dive. You guys can see the code. The code's not that long. It's only probably like 180 lines, but I wanted to put a more simplified version for you guys just to see like what it's doing. You can see the extra vars, the job calling the job, and the if else statement. Um, another way they do it, so we have Splunk, which tracks uh, the Ansible Tower jobs and what's ran on what host. We also have the, the jobs that are tracked in Ansible Tower, and then we have the logs of Ansible Tower being called with Nagio. So that's another way for the on-call team to troubleshoot, track, see if anything's happening or not happening like it's supposed to. Um, and then it's also, it's helpful when we're using the CMDB and the logs for tracking how many times a host alerts, if it's alerting every other hour, every other day, multiple times a week, for then them to trigger the job to make the service now ticket for the team to fix their host. Or to at least make them aware that it's alerting. Because that was the one thing when we first did this, we didn't want teams to not think that there, anything was happening with their host, or not reading emails, not reading blog posts, because it's easy. I am a firm believer not everybody reads emails, so like it's easy to look past it, and this is just a way, you know, now you have a ticket in your service now queue, you have to look at it, fix it, figure out the problem. And then one other step that IT was taking is if they don't fix it, then they're going to stop offering the, um, the monitoring service, and they'll be responsible for it themselves. Um, so the Nagios and Tower Handler script, like I said before, it didn't exist, no integration, and that was a little painful, but um, worked with other people in IT. We got some code, and that's how we got this working. Uh, worked with Ansible, it's open sourced now. It's on GitHub. Con contributions are welcome. It's there for anyone who has Nagios and is interested in this. Um, it makes it way easier. I will make sure my slides are up too to help with anything and always available for email too if people have questions. Um, some of the success that we had with it was over 100 pager playbooks were automated since February of last year. Uh, I think that number is even more now. 50 of them were converted into a single generic service handler template which was like restart services. Um, a lot of them were more customized. It just depended on how detailed service owners would be and work with us to get the playbooks coded. 15% um, of production alerts are automatically handled by Tower and never page the on-call person now. Uh, they're moving more of the application release process out of Ansible Engine into Tower. They're planning to migrate Jenkins to Ansible Tower for base OS image build. And um, they're using Ansible Engine for VM deployment, and they're supposed to move that to Tower. DBA, storage team, networking, they all have a lot of their configuration set up in Tower where they just provide inventory, push that, and then they, they just go kick off a job and 
press a button, and then they have the stack of whatever they need built. Uh, multiple teams at IT began implementing their own automation needs. Um, a lot of people, once they saw demos of this and how it worked, a lot of people wanted to jump on board to have their stuff included with that, but then they also were like, can we automate this, schedule this? So there was a lot of people who didn't know what all Ansible and Ansible Tower could do, and then working with them to get everything set up. Um, so it's been very useful and helpful, and then a lot of people are interested in it. And so now I have some time for Q&A. Does anybody have questions? <laughs> so my question is, like, no, it's okay. Okay. My question would be, how do you handle the um, on-call duties? Do you also handle this in an automatic way? Like, it will not be the same person on call mm -hmm. every night, right? So you will repeat. No, so they, they change shifts. So the way it works is the on-call team, I'm not on that team anymore. But it's a global team, so there's three shift changes. And um, so it's usually the US time, and then after that, Australia takes over, and then after that, India and Brno, uh, those guys do. But they all have, they all are supposed to follow up on the blog post to see what was alerting, what wasn't. They all also have a handoff where they talk to each other about what, what had been going on, and they update each other on that. And then, plus they have all the automation where if something keeps alerting, they have the blog post to see, they're in communications with the service owner and the service now ticket that gets created to them from their queue. And the, the alerting status for the active team, do you, which, how many switches over? Uh, I don't think I understand what you're asking. Because I, if I'm off duty, I will not get an alarm. No, mm-mm. Oh, they have, so they have, um, the way they have their, their duty set for on-call, it's, uh, they actually have it in Puppet where they have the on-call rotation. So they're getting paged. They have email aliases that page them, and then they also have IRC. Um, they have an IRC bot that pages them, too, that they have to always have up and open. And then um, I want to say that's the only two ways that they get paged. And then... Uh, Tower will announce, announce an IRC, emails, and do the blog post for production systems. Okay, also from my understanding, you're a global organization, so basically you don't have to wake up people because... Mm, yeah, okay. that's why they did this, to prevent from... So, like, of course, if they still get paged, they have to get on, but they're not getting paged as often now because it's self-healing, it's automated, and then everything's still being blogged or tickets are being opened. And so they still have the responsibility of looking over it, all that, but it's changed. Instead of them getting paged at 2 o'clock in the morning and having to hop on and fix things, they were fixed, and they don't have to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, so with um, when Nagios is calling Ansible Tower, it's the same Nagios user every time. And so that helps with the tracking. And, but like a service owner can hop on if they need to use Tower to restart their service, and it's fine. Um, the tracking only comes from the Nagios user. And so that's what would get flagged if Nagios is kicking off Tower jobs for you and restarting a service every hour or every day. And I mean, that's usually not expected or wanted, in, especially in production or any environment. But um, production is where they get really flagged. Well, it'll recheck it, but it won't re-kick off the job. It'll page the on-call person. 
and they can look in there and see that their job's still running, if it is. So um, that was one of our issues before, and so that's why we said the five minutes of downtime. We didn't want to set too much in case something major is going on, and we want the person to be paged if it's not fixed within five minutes. And so far, with all the ones that we've automated, they are fixed and validated within five minutes. I mean, there could be the use case where it doesn't, but usually if Tower doesn't fix it, it's a bigger issue more than just the host. It's usually more like infrastructure side, something bigger is going on, and then more things start going down, and then we also don't want them taking all the nodes out of rotation. Like if you have four, we don't want you to go and complete outage because of it, and so there's preventions from that too. So like if you have one or two already out, it's not gonna take out all four, it'll start paging on call. Um, I mean, the service owners give us that, so. Can you some other way to fix So some service owners have complete scripts that have to, they provide it, so it's whatever they need. Like, I don't understand all the applications and what they do, so it's whatever they want. Like, if they need to go in, it, like, I don't know, say their disk is full and it causes some other issue, they can create the playbook to go rm-f some files and then run some other command and then restart services. It's whatever they want to do, but they provide that to us. Yes? Yes. I mean, so they get, they get access to everything but the inventory because we don't want them going in and messing with not their stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. but they get access to everything else. If they want to edit a playbook, the only ones that they're not supposed to touch are the generic ones like service restart. If they want something special outside of what's provided, they can request it or they can code it themselves and then um, just say they need it pointed to their inventory or they could use the, the generic one. Well, that's why um, they do where they create the, well, they do the blog post, but then they also do the ServiceNow ticket where <coughs> lets the service owner know, hey, this is happening, you need to look into your host and figure it out and fix it. And then that's where if they don't fix it, then the on-call team, the operations team can say, we're not going to monitor your host anymore. Kind of a way of forcing them to fix it. So that's where, with in Puppet, is where you configure the check for Nagios, and you tell it what to check against. Like, if the service is down, if it's returning a 500 or 404, like, you configure what you want it to let you know. So it's all, it's working with the service owner, you have that in Puppet, Nagios knows what to look for in that aspect, and then if it alerts a certain way for Nagios, it knows what to call in the Tower API. And then you have your playbooks written in Ansible as the job templates, and then it calls it there based off the inventory. Could you repeat that? It was really painful for on call. <laughs> They were getting a lot of alerts, and I mean, I used to be on that team, and on-call life wasn't for me, but um, it was a lot of pages in the middle of the night, a lot of noise. They still have, they have on-call rotations where they still have work they have to do, and it was blocking them, putting them behind, them not being able to complete their work. So now this lets them focus on other things for IT and operations and infrastructure and not so much having to stop every two minutes to go look at alerts. That was the biggest issue. But it also, I will say, some hosts or some service owners didn't realize that their hosts 
were so bad until it was being tracked by Nagios, and then the Tower API kept kicking off playbook runs, which then brought attention to them to look deeper into things because we were like, hey, this is happening every day, look into that, and then it helped them realize there were bigger issues that they had to address. So that also helped in different ways too. Not many, but it is possible like a little network blip or something where Nagios doesn't have that connection at that second and then it checks again five minutes later and it's clear, then that's usually what, it, what it's there for. Um, the Nagios checks set up like that were before I was even there, but that's what, when I was talking to the SME for Nagios, he said it was set up that way just in case it was something minor like that. I've never seen where it's been a false positive. It was usually always a legit thing, but that's why. No, <laughs> um, so they can easily open it. When I was doing this project, I was working with them hands-on all the way because we were trying to get as many people automated and in this and um, out of where on-call was having to manually do it. Um, now that I'm not that person anymore, they can still open a ticket for consultation for the SMEs and they can help them. Um, they can, if, if they have someone who knows Ansible, yeah, they can do it themselves. But if they don't, they will work with them because we want it automated and we want it to be easier for them. Yeah, kind of like, but I mean, it's worth helping them for an hour if then you don't have to do it anymore. Anybody else? Cool. Well, thank you.